One rapper was killed on live TV, the other had his murder video taped on the CCTV of his favorite cookie store. Hip-hop is a dirty scene, but these rappers I'm about to show got the worst end of the stick. Their loved ones now forever have the memory of exactly how they were brutally killed, etched in their minds but also on camera, forever on the alleys of the internet. Ex Tentacion. If I'm gonna die or ever be a sacrifice, I wanna make sure that my life made at least five million kids happy. Jose Dwayne Ricardo Onfroy, known professionally as Ex Tentacion, had his life stolen in broad daylight. The 20 year old artist had just exited Riva Motorsports, a motorcycle dealership in Deerfield Beach, when a black Dodge Journey SUV blocked his exit. Inside were four men, armed and ready to execute a plan that reeked of organized crime's ruthless efficiency to rob Ex Tentacion. But what transpired was far more heinous. As Ex Tentacion's BMW i8 was trapped, the assailants, brandishing firearms, demanded his property. A struggle ensued, and Boatwright, without a shred of provocation, fired multiple shots, striking Ex Tentacion and leaving him mortally wounded. The chaos of the moment was captured on surveillance footage, a chilling testament to the premeditated nature of the crime. As the suspects fled, leaving behind a scene of devastation, Ex Tentacion was rushed to a nearby hospital. Despite the best efforts of medical personnel, he was pronounced dead, a young life extinguished in a senseless act of violence. The aftermath of the shooting saw an outpouring of grief from fans and residents, with memorials and vigils cropping up across the country. The music industry reeled from the loss, and Ex Tentacion's music soared in popularity, his single Sad reaching the pinnacle of the Billboard Hot 100 posthumously. June 18, 2018, marked the day when Jose Duane Ricardo Onfroy, known to the world as Ex Tentacion, was targeted in a violent robbery that would ultimately claim his life. As earlier stated, the 20-year-old rapper, a figure of both controversy and immense musical talent had been shopping for motorcycles when fate took a grim turn. Michael Boatwright, Trayvon Newsom, Daedric Williams, and Robert Allen. These individuals, though not part of a mafia, were entangled in a web of criminal intent. Their actions that day fueled by greed and callous disregard for human life. The confrontation was swift and deadly. Boatwright, armed and determined, fired his weapon multiple times, striking Ex Tentacion in a brazen act of robbery. The surveillance cameras captured the harrowing scene, documenting the final moments of a life about to be cut tragically short. As the assailants fled, the community reeled from the news of the shooting. Fans and residents alike gathered to mourn, their tributes a mosaic of candles, music, and heartfelt messages. The rapper's influence on his audience was undeniable, and his death left a void that resonated far beyond the streets where he grew up. The pursuit of justice was relentless. One by one, the suspects were apprehended, their faces becoming synonymous with a crime that had stolen not just possessions, but a unique voice from the world of rap. The legal proceedings were meticulous culminating in a trial that saw Boatwright, Newsom, and Williams convicted of first-degree murder and robbery with a firearm in March 2023. Boatwright, identified as the shooter, faced the gravest consequences, receiving two consecutive life sentences without parole, plus 30 years. What makes it even creepier is the fact that Boatwright garnered attention when he blew a kiss to Ex Tentacion's family after being convicted, an act that widely drew public condemnation for its inappropriateness. That's it for the life and legacy of the superstar, Ex Tentacion an artist whose potential was limitless and whose story ended far too soon. It is a narrative of loss, of talent extinguished, and of the relentless quest for justice in the aftermath of a senseless and devastating crime. Do you know who else had their life taken away when they still had so much left to accomplish? Take off. Take Off, born Kersnik Kari Ball, found his calling in music early on. Growing up in Lawrenceville, Georgia, he, alongside family members Quavo and Offset, formed the group that would become known as Migos. Their unique flow, a rapid-fire delivery coupled with catchy ad-libs, catapulted them to fame with hits like Versace and Bad and Bougie. Migos's influence on the rap genre was undeniable, shaping the sound of a new era in hip-hop. But with fame came the inevitable spotlight and the dangers that lurk in the shadows of success. On the fateful night of October 31, 2022, the vibrant city of Houston was hosting a private gathering, a celebration that drew in various figures from the music industry. Among the attendees was 28-year-old Takeoff, who was there alongside his uncle and fellow Migos member, Quavo. The event, held at 810 billiards and bowling, was a convergence of camaraderie and revelry, with no indication of the tragedy that would soon unfold. As the night progressed, the atmosphere was charged with the energy of Halloween festivities. However, as the clock edged 
towards the early hours of November 1st, an altercation broke out. The details were murky, with witnesses providing conflicting accounts, but the outcome was devastatingly clear. Gunfire erupted, and in the chaos that ensued, takeoff was struck by a bullet. The scene quickly descended into pandemonium, with partygoers fleeing in fear and confusion. Emergency services were called to the scene at approximately 2.30 in the morning. Upon their arrival, they were met with a sight that would shake the community to its core. Takeoff lay motionless on the ground, with efforts to revive him proving futile. The news of his passing sent shockwaves through the crowd, and as it rippled out into the world, through the hearts of fans and fellow artists alike, the immediate aftermath was a blur of activity. Police cordoned off the area, and an investigation was launched to piece together the events that led to the shooting. Quavo, who was present during the incident, was unharmed but visibly shaken by the loss of his nephew. The bond they shared was not just musical but familial, and the impact of Takeoff's death on him was profound. Tributes began to pour in as the news spread, with social media becoming a tapestry of mourning and remembrance. Fans, celebrities, and those who had known Takeoff personally shared their grief and disbelief. The hip-hop community, already too familiar with the specter of gun violence, found itself grappling with yet another loss of a young, influential talent. Takeoff's death raised many questions, not just about the circumstances of that night, but also about the broader issues of safety and violence in the entertainment industry. The senseless nature of the incident left many searching for answers and calling for change. As the investigation continued, the focus turned to identifying the perpetrator and understanding the motive behind the shooting. We know who was on the scene, and we will be contacting and reaching out and finding those individuals. This is murder. The Houston Police Department appealed to the public for information, emphasizing the need for justice in the wake of such a senseless act. The loss of takeoff was not just the loss of a rapper. It was the loss of a son, a friend, and a visionary whose potential was cut tragically short. The music he left behind, the verses he crafted, and the impact he made on the world would endure, but the void left by his absence would be felt by many for years to come. Tupac Shakur, the night of September 7, 1996, remains one of the most infamous dates in music history. Tupac Shakur, at the height of his career, attended a Mike Tyson boxing match at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Hours later, while riding in a black BMW alongside Death Row Records CEO Suge Knight, a white Cadillac pulled up to their vehicle at a stoplight on Flamingo Road and opened fire. Tupac was struck by four bullets. One grazed his head, while the others hit his chest, pelvis, and right hand. How did the events unfold? Following a match while exiting, one of Knight's associates, Trayvon Trey Lane, a member of the Mob of Pirates gang from Compton, California, a member of the rival Southside Compton Crips in the lobby of the MGM Grand. Previously, in July 1996, Anderson and a group of Southside Crips had tried to rob Lane at a Foot Locker store in the Lakewood Center Mall, Lakewood, California. Lane informed Shakur of Anderson's presence, prompting Shakur to confront Anderson. Shakur questioned if he was from the South, referring to the Southside Crips and struck him, causing him to fall. Shakur, along with Knight's entourage, then participated in assaulting Anderson. The altercation caught on the MGM Grand surveillance surveillance was eventually broken up by the hotel security. After the fight, Shakur returned to his hotel room at the Luxor Las Vegas. There, he told his girlfriend, Kidata Jones, about his involvement in the fight with Anderson. Despite having earlier promised to return to her after stepping into the MGM Grand and leaving her in the vehicle, later Shakur changed clothes and left with Knight in a BMW sedan to head to Club 662, a venue owned by Knight, where he was scheduled to perform at a charity concert. Between 11 o'clock and 11.05 p.m., Tupac, Shakur, and Sug night were stopped by Las Vegas police for loud music and missing license plates, which were later found in the trunk. Shortly after being released at a red light near the Maxim Hotel, Shakur spoke to two women in a nearby car and invited them to Club 662. At 11.15 p.m., a white Cadillac pulled up alongside them, and a gunman in the back seat opened fire with a Glock 22, hitting Shakur four times and causing Knight minor injuries from fragmentation. Despite being wounded, Knight managed to drive a mile away before being stopped by police, who then called for medical help. Both were transported to the University Medical Center of Southern Nevada. At the hospital, Shakur was sedated and placed in a medically induced coma due to his critical condition but briefly regained consciousness when Kidata Jones played music for him. Despite efforts to save him, Shakur died of respiratory failure leading to cardiac arrest on September 13, 1996, after his right lung was removed. Knight, who was released the day after the shooting, was uncooperative with police, providing no useful information. The investigation was hampered by a lack 
of cooperation from Shakur's associates, some of whom, fearing further attacks, reportedly brought weapons to the hospital. Shakur's last words to a police officer inquiring about the shooter were defiant, and he passed without identifying his attacker. On July 18, 2023, the Las Vegas Police Department carried out a search warrant at a residence in Henderson, Nevada, as part of the ongoing investigation into Tupac Shakur's murder. The home was later identified as belonging to the wife of Dwayne Keith D. Davis. Keith D. was arrested on the morning of September 29, 2023, in connection with Shakur's murder. Young Dolph Memphis, Tennessee, a city with a soul where the streets hum with the history of music legends, would come to know the name Adolph Robert Thornton Jr., but the world would recognize him as Young Dolph, the self-made rap mogul whose life was a testament to the power of perseverance. On a day that dawned like any other in Memphis, the sun would set on a city in mourning. November 17, 2021, became a date etched in infamy, the day the music was silenced and a beacon of Memphis was extinguished. Young Dolph, the self-made icon of the Bluff City, was visiting a bakery he frequented, a place where the aroma of fresh cookies was often met with the warmth of his presence. But on this fateful day, the harmony of daily life was shattered by the sound of gunfire. The news spread like wildfire, a blaze of disbelief and despair, engulfing the hearts of fans and residents alike. Young Dolph had been shot and killed, his life stolen at the age of 36, right in the community he loved and uplifted. The very spot where he took his last breath became hallowed ground, a place where fans gathered to memorialize him, laying down bouquets, lighting candles, and playing his music, creating a symphony of sorrow and tribute. Who had taken the life of this Memphis legend? Security cameras, silent witnesses to the tragedy, held crucial evidence. One camera, positioned right above the bakery's door, was hoped to have captured the moment that would lead to justice. The Memphis Police Department released the images, urging the community to step forward with any information that could identify the perpetrators of this heinous act. The aftermath of Young Dolph's murder was a tapestry of grief and outrage. The community grappled with the loss, questioning the future for Memphis's youth and the cycle of violence that had claimed too many lives. Memphis Mayor Jim Strickland addressed the city's challenges, pointing to weak state laws that allowed easy access to guns while failing to punish their wrongful use. We have weak state laws that allow easy and widespread access to guns, while at the same time not punishing the wrongful use of those guns. As the investigation unfolded, two gunmen were identified and the pursuit for justice crossed state lines. Justin Johnson, Cornelia Smith, and Shundale Barnett became the names associated with the tragedy. Their faces spread across news outlets as the alleged architects of the murder. Johnson was captured by police in Indiana, while Smith and Barnett faced the consequences of their actions. The community's heartache was compounded by the revelation that another individual, Hernandez Govan, was indicted for allegedly ordering the a hit on young Dolph. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly coming together, but the full picture of why this beloved figure was targeted remained obscured by the shadows of unanswered questions. Young Dolph's legacy was honored in the wake of his passing. A street in Memphis was renamed to commemorate his influence, and a bill was proposed to establish November 17 as the Adolph Thornton Day of Service in Tennessee. The city he championed in life continued to champion him in death, ensuring that his impact would resonate for generations to come. Jam Master J. Born Jason William Mizell on January 21, 1965, in the bustling borough of Brooklyn, New York City, Jam Master Jay's journey into the pantheon of hip-hop royalty began with the blare of a trumpet at the tender age of three. Music coursed through his veins, a legacy inherited from a family where rhythm and melody were as essential as the air they breathed. His childhood was a symphony of instruments, from the bass to the guitar and the drums, a trifecta that laid the foundation for his future mastery. Beyond the stage and studio, Jam Master Jay's life Life was rich with the beats of family, entrepreneurship, and mentorship. As a father of three sons, Jay's legacy extended into his home. His children would carry the rhythm of their father's influence into their own creative endeavors, with Jason Jr. and TJ following in his footsteps as DJs, spinning their own narratives into the fabric of hip-hop culture. Jay's personal life was not without its trials. He survived a car accident on the day after Christmas in 1987, and a year later, a gunshot wound to the leg, both incidents that could have cut his life's track short. Yet he emerged with a renewed sense of purpose, channeling his energies into fostering the 
next generation of talent. In 1989, Jam Master J founded his own record label, Jam Master J Records, which would become a launchpad for artists like 50 Cent and Onyx. His vision was clear, to give back to the community that had raised him, to lift others as he had risen. His commitment to education and empowerment was further exemplified by the establishment of the Scratch DJ Academy in Manhattan in 2002, with the mission to provide education and access to the art form of the DJ and producer. But the music would come to an abrupt and tragic halt on October 30th, 2002. I was taking the boys to school and I said, hey, come back, make sure you say goodbye to your father. I didn't know that would be the last time that they saw their dad. In a recording studio on Merrick Boulevard in Jamaica, Queens, the unthinkable happened. 7.30, Wednesday night, Jamaica, Queens. Jam Master J, born Jason Mazel, was laying down tracks in his studio. One or two men in dark clothes buzzed to be let in. The intruders pulled guns, firing three shots from a 40 caliber semi-automatic one bullet killing Mazel as he sat on the couch. Jam Master J was murdered, a gunshot wound ending a life that had influenced so many. The hip-hop community reeled at the loss of a pioneer, a mentor, a friend. The case would go cold, leaving questions unanswered and a legacy tinged with the pain of loss. The years following Jay's death saw speculation and investigation, with names like Kenneth McGriff and Ronald Washington emerging as figures in a complex narrative of music, crime, and betrayal. It wasn't until 2020 that arrests were made, bringing a semblance of closure to a case that had haunted the hip-hop world for nearly two decades. Jam Master Jay's influence, however, remains undiminished. His spirit lives on in the grooves of vinyl he once spun, in the academy that bears his name, and in the hearts of those who continue to cherish his memory. His story is one of triumph and tragedy, a reminder of the fragility of life and the enduring power of music. MO3 Born on May 31, 1992 in the bustling city of McKinney, Texas, Melvin Abdul Noble Jr. was a name few knew, but MO3, a moniker that would soon echo through the streets of Dallas, was destined for notoriety. His journey began with a childhood move to North Dallas, a place that would shape his character and his music. The concrete jungle of North Dallas, with its vibrant culture and harsh realities, became the backdrop for MO3's lyrical narratives, which resonated with authenticity and raw emotion. MO3's passion for music was evident from a young age, but it was his unique blend of rapping and singing that set him apart from his peers. He drew inspiration from the struggles and triumphs of everyday life, channeling his experiences into a sound that was undeniably his own. His debut mixtape, Shataz, released on September 3, 2014, was a bold introduction to the music scene, showcasing his versatility and storytelling prowess. The mixtape was a gritty, unfiltered portrayal of life on the streets, and it quickly garnered attention from local fans and beyond. But his fame was short-lived when tragedy struck. The sky over Dallas on November 11, 2020, folded. MO3 had been shot and killed in broad daylight, a tragedy that sent shockwaves through the hip-hop community and beyond. The events leading up to his death were as dramatic as they were devastating. MO3 was driving on Interstate 35 when he was pursued by another vehicle. In a desperate attempt to escape, he stopped his car in front of a semi on the center lane and fled on foot, only to be chased down and fatally wounded by multiple rifle shots. The aftermath of MO3 3's death was a period of intense mourning and reflection. Fans, family, and fellow artists poured out tributes, expressing their disbelief and sorrow over the loss of such a vibrant life and talent. The rapper, at the age of 28, left behind not only a promising career, but also three children, two girls, and a boy, who would now have to navigate a world without their father. The investigation into MO3's murder was swift, with law enforcement releasing images of the suspect, who was seen wearing a ski mask and believed to be driving a black Chevrolet Camaro, model year 2014 or 2015. The pursuit for justice was relentless, and on December 9, 2020, Hewan Dontrell White was arrested and charged with MO3's murder. Several months later, on April 23, 2021, a second suspect, Devin Maurice Brown, was also charged in connection with the fatal shooting. MO3's death was not just the loss of another rapper, it was the silencing of a voice that had become a beacon of hope and resilience for many. His music, which had been a source of strength for those who faced similar struggles, now served as a haunting reminder of the fragility of life and the pervasive violence that plagues many communities. Despite the tragedy, MO3's legacy continued to grow. His posthumous album, Shot Us For Eva, was a bittersweet gift to fans who were still reeling from his untimely death. The album soared to number 36 on the US Billboard 200, a clear indication of the impact MO3 had made and the void his passing had left in the music world. Nipsey Hussle
Beneath the Los Angeles sky in the Crenshaw District, the story of Nipsey Hussle began. Born Hermes Joseph Asgedem on August 15, 1985, he was a child of the concrete jungle where the rhythm of the streets often dictated the tempo of life. Hussle's early years were a crucible that forged his character as he navigated the complexities of gang culture, becoming a member of the Roland Sixties, Neighborhood Crips. This affiliation, though perilous, was a chapter in his life that would later influence his music and his mission. Tragically, on March 30, 31st, 2019, Nipsey Hussle was fatally shot multiple times in the parking lot of his Marathon clothing store in South Central Los Angeles at 3.18 p.m. The assailant also kicked Hussle in the head. Two other individuals were injured during the incident. All three were taken to the hospital, where Hussle was declared dead at 3.55 p.m. He was 33 years old. The police identified 29-year-old Eric Ronald Holder Jr. as the suspect. Believing the motive might have been a personal dispute, as Holder was acquainted with Hussle, Holder was arrested on April 2, 2019, by the Los Angeles Police Department and held in solitary confinement. He was indicted by a grand jury on May 9 for one count of murder, two counts of attempted murder and assault with a firearm, and one count of possessing a firearm as a felon. The trial, which faced several delays, eventually started in mid-June 2022. Prosecution was led by Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney John McKinney, while Aaron Jansen headed the defense. The defense argued that Holder did not plan to kill Hustle, claiming it was a spontaneous spontaneous act during a heated moment. However, McKinney contended that Holder had premeditated the act, despite it not being planned over a long period. The conflict stemmed from an argument about a rumor that Holder had cooperated with police. On July 6, 2022, Holder was convicted of first-degree murder and two counts of attempted voluntary manslaughter for the injuries to the bystanders. He was sentenced on February 22, 2023, to 60 years in prison by Superior Court Judge H. Clay Jack. The Marathon Clothing Store and Vector 90 stand as beacons of of his entrepreneurial vision. Even after his tragic death, Hustle's spirit endures, inspiring countless individuals to continue the marathon of progress. Nipsey Hustle's story is not just one of a rapper who made it big, it's a tale of a visionary who gave his all for the empowerment of his community. Following the announcement of his death, celebrities and public figures, including Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, expressed their condolences on social media and extended their sympathy to Hustle's family. A public memorial service for Hustle was held on April 11th at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, with attendees receiving free tickets. Former President Barack Obama commended Hustle's positive vision for his Crenshaw neighborhood, recognizing his ability to see potential where others saw despair. The funeral procession extended 25.5 miles from Los Angeles to Forest Lawn Memorial Park, passing through significant locations including Watts. The Nation of Islam provided security, ensuring respect throughout the community. Large crowds, particularly at Watts Towers, highlighted his significant impact. In the in the wake of Hustle's death, gang leaders recognized his influence and initiated efforts to reduce violence. Gangs across LA and Compton came together at memorial events and agreed to avoid encroaching on each other's territories and reduce conflicts, marking a significant though temporary ceasefire reminiscent of peace efforts in 1992. Enjoyed the video? Crave more excitement? Stay tuned by clicking on any of the cards on your screen right now for more thrilling content. See you next time!